specials here and we'll just do a couple things. I'm going to have you guys just look at some equations and decide if they're growth or decay. Have you guys write a couple equations given a couple points or a graph and then the back of the notes today we're going to apply the general form I'm going to give you on the front to some actual word problems. So the general form, if you've never seen this before, of an exponential looks like this. y equals a times b to the x. The only thing that's going to be taken to the exponent there is the b value. So there, and you, a can be 1, um, but you do have to have an exponent that's a variable for an exponential function. And I'm just going to write this. This is really going to apply more to what we're going to do on the back. But a is going to be if you're working with a word problem, like the initial amount that you start with. B is what we call the growth, bless you, or decay factor, which I have like a little note underneath here how to calculate that. And we'll talk about that in a second. And X generally in these problems, if we're working with a word problem, is gonna be time. And Underneath there, it says x has to be a real number. It says a can't be equal to zero. If a was zero, it would wipe that whole equation out because we'd be multiplying by zero. So that's why it can't be zero. Next to that, it says b is greater than zero. That means b has to be a positive number. If I'm greater than zero, it just means I'm positive. And kind of nitpicky on the end there, b can't be equal to one. The reason for that, if b is equal to one, Right? That's what I'm taking to my exponent. If I do 1 to any power, this is 1. So if I had b value of 1, it would actually, thank you, sir, it would actually just be the equation of a line. So b cannot be equal to 1. Okay, now, depending on the type of question you are working with, this is going to be more applied on the back, but we're going to use it a little bit in these first two questions, or first two examples here in a second. But if b is if you have growth, all right, so it, the growth is going to be 1 plus, it says R here. R is going to be a rate, and they will give that to you either in the equation or in the problem to figure that out. Most of the time, the rate is given to you as a percentage, so you might have to convert it to a decimal. We'll go over that in a couple minutes, but um, if it's growth, it's going to be 1 plus the rate. If it's decay, it's going to be 1 minus the rate. Now, if you're actually looking at an equation, which is what we're going to do here, ooh, sorry, in a second. All right, if b is greater than 1, so if whatever's in your parentheses to your exponent is bigger than 1, that is going to indicate to you you have exponential growth. Now, b cannot be negative. Remember, I just told you b is positive. So this is going to say, I'm going to put a little compound inequality. I'm going to say 0 is less than b is less than 1. So if that's the case, if 0 is like 0.2 or 0.5 or something like that, something between 0 and 1, that's going to indicate to you the equation is decay. And then the other thing, just like a little side note real quick, if these questions they'll say is this growth decay or neither neither is going to happen if the a value is negative otherwise it's going to fall into the either the category of growth or decay but if the a value so the starting thing right after the equal sign if you see a negative sign that's not plus you're going to be growth or decay okay now in general if you have an equation, you can literally look at it and tell me if it's growth or decay or neither without doing anything, really. Just by looking at it, if you can remember, if it's B value is bigger than 1, it's growth. If it's between 0 and 1, it's decay. Now, it says without graphing, determine whether the function is growth, decay, or neither. So in this particular case, if it's neither, if that very first thing is negative, so I've got positive 100, positive 16, positive 4, so none of these are going to be neither because there's no a value that is negative. So don't worry about that. So we're just going to decide growth or decay. And then it's going to ask you, could you tell me what the percentage of growth or decay is? Okay, so if you look at your b value, I have 100 times 0.78 to the x. Would you call that growth or decay? 
Decay, right. It's smaller than one, so it's got to be decay. All right, now, the decay is the one I think is a little trickier for telling the percentage of growth or decay. So um, you can find this algebraically. If you have decay, it's 1 minus the rate. So our B value here is 0.78 could be 1 minus our rate. So if I want to tell the percentage of growth or decay, we're just going to subtract 1 here real quick. And if I do that, you're going to get 0.22 negative would be the negative version of the rate. The two negatives cancel on either side. So 0.22 is the rate. Now, the question says the percentage of growth or decay. So does anybody know how to change a decimal into a percent? If I give you 0.22, like what percent would that be? 22. And if you're like, what? I don't know. Just if you have a rate, you can just multiply it by 100. This is 22% decay. Okay, another way to think about that, like if you had, if you thought about your test, you had 100%, right? If I told you you got a 78 on your test, how, many, how much percentage did I take away? If you got a 78, I took away 22%, so that's the decay factor. That's another way to think about it. It's the difference between that number and one when you do decay. All right, what do you guys think if I got 16 times 0.5 to the x? Just look at that b value, whatever you take into the exponent. Is that going to tell you growth or decay? Decay, right? It's smaller than 1, but greater than 0. Now, again, you can find this algebraically. Can anybody, if you have 0.5, can they tell me what percentage that would be in terms of the amount of decay? 50%. So 0.5, again, if you want to do, like, that's your B value, 0.5 is 1 minus your rate. If you solve that, subtract 1, 0.5. It, or sorry, negative 0.5 would be my negative rate. The negatives would cancel. So 0.5 is my rate. Multiply that by 100 real quick. This is a 50% decay. Or like I said, I just look at it and I'm like, okay, think of your test as being 1. If you got 0.5, what's the difference there? It's going to be 0.5, so it's going to be 50% decay. All right, now, the last one, I have 4 times 1.3 to the x. So the 1.3 is going to indicate to you whether it's growth or decay. What do you guys think for the last one? It's got to be growth, right? The other two were decay. All right, now, again, you can use those lovely little growth and decay. So if you have growth, your b value is 1 plus your rate. Now, in this case, you're not going to deal with the negative. I'm just going to subtract 1, and I'm going to get 0.3 would be my rate. What would 0.3 be as a percentage? 30. 30% 30 just multiply. If you're not sure, if you have a rate, just take it and multiply it by 100. That will give you the percentage. So this is 30%. Now, another way I look at that, look at, like, you have 1, and you have 0.3 over that. So if you're doing growth, whatever you are over 1, that's going to be, multiply that by 100, that's going to be your percent. So if it's 0.3, it's just going to be 30%. And that one is going to be 30% growth. Is anybody having a question so far? Decay is 1 minus the rate, growth is 1 plus the rate. Okay, now, the second thing we're going to do with these exponential equations is I'm going to give you two points. And it, I promise this is not hard, but you're probably going to want your calculator. Okay, I'm going to give you two points, and you're going to use those two points to write the exponential equation that would go through those two points in that general form I gave you guys at the top of that page, y equals ab to the x. Okay, now, not hard, I promise, but again, you might want your calculator. The only thing I would tell you, um, I'm going to start with the point that has the bigger x value. So you're going to get two points. Just do this for me. It'll make the algebra so much easier if you do this. Whichever of the two points has the bigger x value. So one x value is two, the other x value is four. You want to start with the point that's got the bigger x value. So I'm going to start with the point that's that four one third. Okay, here's the deal. You are just going to plug those points in for x and y into that general form. a and b will be variables when you do that. 
So if I just use this first point, I'm just doing AB to the X, okay? The Y coordinate is one third. I don't know A or B. That's what we're gonna try and solve here. We do have two points, so I can plug those in for X and Y. When the X coordinate is four, so that would be the exponent on B, the Y coordinate is one third. So I'm just plugging that in. I know that's a relationship. Then I'm just gonna do the other point real quick. So the other point is two, three. So Y is three when AB squared is what we have in our exponential. So I know the X and Y, so I'm literally plugging them in for X and Y in that general form. Okay, now I have two equations and two unknowns, and this is a little throwback to first semester, but probably not something you have ever done. If you have two equations with two unknowns, we can solve it using a system. Now, typically you guys, like when we do linear systems, you probably add the bottom line to the top line or subtract or something like that. If you have an exponential, and this will work every time because of the way it's set up, you can divide the top line by the bottom line. The reason I'm gonna do that is because if I set this up correctly, I would always have just A divided by A which would become one and cancel that out. Now, I've got a couple here that are fractions, so this is a little bit tricky, but what I would do here, I'm gonna grab my calculator, or you could do this by hand. I'm gonna take one third, and I'm just gonna put parentheses around that in my calculator since I don't have my fraction key. So I'm just gonna take one third, and I'm gonna divide that by three. And it's gonna give me a nasty decimal. So I'm just going to hit my math, enter, enter, so it'll convert it to a fraction for me. It's not nice. And so if I take one-third, divide by three, I'm going to get one-ninth. Now the A's canceled out. What I have to do with the B's is use my like little exponent properties. So if I said we were going to do B to the fourth divided by B squared, what would you simplify that to be? B squared, right? Just subtract the exponents or tell me where you got, you got more Bs on the top. So this would be B squared. Now, all we have to do to figure this out, we're just going to take square root of both sides real quick. And remember, I was telling you guys in the directions at the very top, the B value is not allowed to be negative for any exponential. So you don't want to put a plus and minus here because it's not legal for the B value to be negative. So just square root of one is one, square root of nine is three. Don't put a plus and minus on any, if you take a fourth root or a sixth root or something like that, don't put a plus and minus because the B value in an exponential is not allowed to be negative. So here's my B value. Okay, now. If I'm trying to write this equation, I have to write it in the format y equals ab to the x. y and x should be variables. So this is just like a system old school from Algebra 1. We're going to plug this back in, and you can plug it into either one of the equations. We're going to use that to solve for a. I'm just going to use the second one. Um, it really doesn't matter. You can use either one. So I'm just going to say, all right, we had 3 equals a times b squared, but now I know what b is. b is one-third, and that's going to be squared. All right, now I'm going to end up, if I square one-third, you square the one, you get one again. Square three, you're going to get nine. So to get the a value, i got to take, either multiply both sides by nine, or you can divide both sides by one-third, whatever's easier for you. And a should end up being... 27. Now, what I would need to see for my actual answer is you take the a and b value, x and y should be variables in your general form, so it would be y equals a is 27, b is 1 third, and x should be x in the general form. And if you want to plug in either one of those points to check, like do 27 times 1 third squared and check to see if that's 3, you can do that, um, but you should be okay. As long as you try and start with the x value that's bigger, it's going to make the problem easier to work with. Is anybody having a question at the moment? Okay, let me try one more with you. I tried to put ones that were kind of tricky on here that had some fractions to them. So whichever point has the bigger x value. So I've got a negative 2 and a positive 2. So start with the one with the bigger x value when you set up your system because it's just going to make it easier to work with algebraically. Otherwise, you're going to have negative exponents and you don't want to mess around with that if you don't have to. 
Okay, so for this one, I would do my y coordinate is 20 when my x coordinate is 2. So I'm going to write 20 equals ab squared. So the x value is the exponent, the y value is what it's equal to. And I'm just going to repeat that process real quick for the other point. The y value is 5 over 4 when the x value is negative 2. So I'm setting up a system. I've got two points. I've got two equations, two unknowns. And if you're working with an exponential, this works every time. You're just going to divide the top line by the bottom line. When you do that, the way this is set up, you just have a divided by a, so it just cancels out every time. And again, it's up to you. You could do this by hand or just grab your calculator real quick. I'm going to do 20 divided by 5 fourths. And actually, that's a nice answer. That's 16. Now, the tricky part here, see if you remember from our last unit, your exponent properties. If I take b squared and I divide that by b to the negative 2 power, what would happen there? What would b's exponent end up as? You take b squared over b to the negative 2. They don't, because the, the one on top is positive and the one on top is negative, they don't cancel out. It's very tricky. Yes, good. Yes, 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 yes. This goes up. Okay, so what would that make the top of the exponent become? 4. The negative 2 is going to come up, so you'd have b squared times b squared when you move it up to get rid of that negative exponent, so that actually becomes b to the 4th. If you wanted to think about it in terms of exponent properties, maybe don't write this on your paper, but this would be 2 minus a negative 2, which ends up being 2 plus 2, which is also another way to do that if you subtract the exponents there, but it's still going to become 4. Now, again, we're taking a 4th root here, and we're not going to put a plus and minus. Normally, if we were just solving a regular basic equation, we would put a plus and minus when we introduce that 4th root, but because the b value has to be positive if we're talking about an exponential, don't put the plus and minus. Anybody know 4th root of 16? 2. Okay, now once you got that, it's completely up to you. Plug it back into either equation. If it's me, I am not messing around with that fraction or that negative exponent, so I would plug it into the first equation to figure out the a value there. So I'm just going to use 20. a, I don't know. b, we just figured out was 2. And so if the y value is 20, the x value was 2 there. And I figured out the, the b value used in our system there. So 20 equals a times 2 squared, which is just a times 4. So then all I got to do is divide 20 by 4. a is going to end up being 5. And then when I actually write my equation, right, you want the general form. So it's going to be y equals a, which is 5, times b, which is 2, and then to the x. You should have a y and an x when you write a general form. Bless you for your exponential. It's not, it's not bad. I kind of picked some harder problems for us to work on together. Is anybody having a question? Yeah. Why is you the problem? So like right here, if I just I have a times 4, so if you divide both sides by 4, 20 divided by 4, so I just didn't write it out. I was running out of space, but yeah, just divide 20 by 4, you get 5. Really good question. Okay. Now I have one more in this same example, but it's obviously presented in a different way. So... I'm not giving you two points here. It gives you a graph, and it says the same thing, right? The general form of the exponential, just given this graph. So I want y equals ab to the x from the graph. How would I do this? Diff like, what would you have to do with the graph? Hmm. What would I do differently if I give you a graph instead of two points? Pick two points, okay. All right, so who's up for the 4 and the 768? Don't, no, no, no. Okay, no, 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 no. Let's make our life easy. Okay, here's the, if you get a graph, if you get a graph, right? Um, if you have a point that has 0, for sure pick that. All right, so I have 0, 3. Definitely pick that. And that you can, honestly, you could pick any of these points, do the process we just did, you'll get the same answers. But I'm telling you, if you have a point that's 0, I'm going to explain this in one second, pick that point. And I'm just going to pick the point right next to it, which is 112. You can pick, you just need two, just any two points off that graph. I'm going to use the 0, 3, and I'm going to use, oh, I just wrote that backwards, forgive me, 112. 
Okay, now, just like before, if you're going to set up your system, I would always tell you, pick the x value that's bigger. So the point that has the bigger x value would be that 112. So I would do 12 equals a, b, and then the exponent there is just 1. Now, here's the deal. This is why it's really nice. The other point has 3 as the y value when the x value is 0. If I just asked you what b to the 0 power was, what would you tell me? Not b to the first. Anything to the 0 power is? Not 0. 1. Anything to the 0 power is 1. Okay, so that's why I would tell you to pick that point. So really what I have going on here in this equation, this is really just 3 equals a times 1, which is just straight up the a value because a times one would be a, right? So if I have a point that zero something, that value is gonna be the a. All right, now I still have to plug it back in to one of, I, and you could use any of these points, but I can see the a value without even doing a system. Now, um, let me just plug it into that other equation I jotted down, the other point. So 12 equals three, which is our a value, times b to the first. Now, in that scenario, b to the first power is just b. So all I got to do is divide both sides by 3. And this one is a lot faster than some of the ones we were just working with. But the b value there would be 4. Anytime you got a point with a 0, use that because you can use that to figure out the a value immediately without even doing a system. Now, the actual equation then for this graph, y equals a is 3, b is 4 to the x. Does anybody have any questions? Now, the, the previous two questions we just looked at, you were kind of forced to use specific points because I just gave you two points. But if you have a graph, you have more options for what you can use. Okay, now, on the back, this is what you're going to want for a calculator for these questions because these are not the nicest answers. All right, so we're going to use that y equals ab to the x to set up a model for each of these situations. I promise it's much faster than what we were doing on the front. You're just going to pick out the A and B values from the actual problem. You won't have to do a system or anything like that. So anytime you have your A value for a word problem, that's going to be whatever you start with or your initial amount. So this question is going to say we've got a house and we purchased it for $155,000. So straight up right there, that's your A value. Okay, now the B value, you have to determine based on reading the question whether it's growth or decay. So this question says we've got this 155K house is appreciating in value 3.5% every year. What does appreciating mean to you? Going up, right? Okay, so if it's going up, then this is going to be growth. So appreciating, sorry, this is growth. Now, if you have growth, your B value is 1 plus the rate, and I'm going to explain that to you in a second. Most of these questions will give you the rate as a percentage, so you have to convert it to a decimal. All right, so your rate is 3.5%. Do you guys know how to change that from a percentage to a decimal? Like, what would I do to the 3.5, or what would it turn into? 0.35. Okay, so what you want to plug in for the rate, 0 0.035. If you're like, what the heck, where did you come up from that? You can scooch the decimal place over two spots, or if you have a percentage, take 3.5, divide it by 100. If you're working with a percentage, just take the percentage, divide it by 100. That'll tell you what it is as a decimal, so it's 0 0.035. Okay, now, what I need to do for the question, though, is add 1 to that rate. So my B value is going to be 1 plus that 0 0.035, which is 1.035. Okay, so if I'm going to write a model, this is y equals a is 155,000 times b to the x. Okay, now let me show you why we do this real quick. So if I have this $155,000 house, right? If I gain 3.5% every year, if I multiply that by 0 0.035, I get 5,425. So that's what, what that would tell me is 
the house increases in value by $5,425. I'd have to add that to the original amount to get the total for the house. Okay, here's the deal. When you do that 155 thousand times 1.035 that one accounts for what you already have and then adds that 5425 for you so that's why we do one plus the rate it's just taking what you would get and automatically adding it on to the amount that you already have so like after a year this house would be worth 160,425 so that's why it's one plus the rate it's just adding in what you would increase automatically all in one step now, most of these questions are going to say, okay, tell me what the house is worth or whatever after a certain amount of time. And this question is going to say 10 years. So what that means, we're going to take our model. And if I want to know what it's worth after 10 years, that means we're just going to plug in 10 for X. X is going to represent the time here. So if they ask you to write a general equation, that's what we just did. Then to answer the question, how much is the house worth in 10 years? 155 times, whoops. 1.035, and then I'm just gonna use parentheses around whatever I wanna to take to the exponent. That should take care of me there. Okay, now, use your little caret button that's above the division sign. We're gonna take that to the 10th power, and then you just hit enter, and you should be good. Now, any of these questions that are about money, we're gonna go two decimal places, right? Because we're talking about money. So in 10 years, this house is worth $218,642. I'm gonna round that. 81 cents the two decimal places when you're talking about money Is anybody have a question at the moment? Okay. Now my next question it says I got a new truck and it sells for 29,000 so 29,000 is going to be my initial amount which is a Now what does the word depreciate mean to you guys is that gonna be growth or decay? That's gonna go down depreciate um, this is going to be decay. So when I do my B value here, it's going to be one minus the rate. Basically, like what rate does the truck hold on to? <laughs> so if I, my rate is 12%, 12% as a decimal is 0 0.12. So when I write down my B value here, I want to do one minus 0 0.12, which is going to be 0.88 or if you thought if you wanted to think about it in terms of the test like if you had 100% for your test it took 12% away you get an 88 so it's going to have that truck holding on to 88% of its value okay now again let me show you real quick if I buy this truck and I multiply that by 0.12 that means the truck would lose $3,480 of its value but if I do 29,000 times 0.88 that will then just tell me that after a year the truck is worth 25,520 it just takes what you have and subtracts the 12 percent I do this all the time like if I go to the store and something's like 25 percent on sale I will just take like let's say I'm looking at a pair of jeans that's 50 bucks I will just take 50 times 0.75 if it's 25 percent off because that'll tell me what it's actually going to cost so it's just the decay rate so it's going to hold 88 percent of its value it's just subtracting that all in one step from for you when you subtract it from one so your general form here you got 29,000 every year we're going to take 12 percent away so it's going to hold 88 percent of its value and X is going to represent time there again, so that's your general form. And if you want to tell me, okay, what's this truck worth after seven years, all you're going to do is plug in seven for X. So 29, one, two, three, and then 0.88, and then I just put whatever I'm taking, my B value, I put that in parentheses just to be careful, and then I'm going to take that to the seventh power. So after seven years, the truck is worth... $11,851 and 59 cents. Again, if you're talking about money, just go two decimal places there. Okay, now the last question is a little weird. So this says an investment is worth $56,578 after eight years. Now, this is kind of tricky, but it says the growth factor for the investment is 1.15. So they don't tell you a percentage. They straight up say growth factor. If they say growth factor or decay factor in the question, 
they are straight up just telling you the B value. You don't have to do one minus the rate or one plus the rate. They're actually just telling you that for the problem. So it says the growth factor for the investment is 1.15. Find the original value invested. So is this 56,578, is that the A value here? No, What? Where, where would you plug that in? Where it equals, exactly. This is going to be the Y value here. So after eight years, this is what it's worth, that 56578 I don't know what the initial investment was, so that's going to be my A value. Now, my B, it straight up said the growth factor, 1.15. That means this is growing 15% every year based on that number. And then I actually know X here as well because it tells me this investment is worth that 56000 after eight years. So what I want to do to solve this question is kind of a little bit backwards. I want to take that 56,578, divide it by 1.15 to the eighth power. So I'm just you can just type it right in your calculator. And the A value, again, there we're talking about money, so go two decimal places. This should be $18,495 and like 45 cents. So after eight years, that's a super good investment if that's gone up to 56,578. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, at the bottom real quick. This is a half-life, which is both basically like a special case of an exponential. If you guys are in chemistry or anything like that, you've probably seen this formula, but I'm just going to write it down here real quick. So half-life in general is the time it takes for a substance to lose half of its value or decay half of its value. So here, Y is going to be the amount you have left. A is going to be the initial amount. Whenever you have a half-life, you're cutting it in half. So the B value is always 0.5 or 1 half if you want to write the fraction. And then the one thing that's a little bit weird here is the exponent. And I'm going to explain that with this first example. But the exponent is still in time x, but it's a fraction. It's x over whatever the half-life of the substance is. And that would change depending on what the question is and what substance you're talking about. So we're going to work on this for this very first one here. Now, a lot of these have weird names because they're elements that they use in different things in a hospital or something like that. These are real-world things, and a lot of them do have a number within the name, but that does not go into the formula, so just be real careful with that. All right, so this says a hospital prepares a 50-milligram supply of Technectium 99, which has a half-life of six hours. Okay, here's what you need. The 50 milligrams is going to be your A and the six hours is going to be your half-life, all right? So a general formula here, we would have y equals 50. If I'm working with a half-life problem, the b value is always a half because we're going to take 50% away. Now, my exponent here is x time, which is going to have to be in hours, over my half-life, which this substance, it tells me it's six hours. Okay, so let me show you how this works. If... I have these different values, and it just says round to the nearest hundredth if we need to, because some of them can be weird answers, but some of them are not. So it says how much would be left after six hours? Okay, so if I have 50 milligrams, six hours is my half-life, how much should be left after six hours? 25, right? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to cut it in half once. Let me show you how it works in the actual formula. So if I do one half, if my half-life is six hours, the exponent would be six over six, x over six, that's the half-life. So I'm gonna have an exponent of one if I simplified that. That just means I'm cutting it in half once. So that's why it's x over the half-life. It's gonna determine how many half-lives you do. So this should just be 25 milligrams left. Okay, can anybody tell me how much, just, just like don't plug it in, like how much should be left after 12 hours? 12 and a half, you're just going to cut it in half again. Let me, let me explain. All right, so this would be 12 over 6. Half of 25, because I'm going to cut it in half again, is 12.5. If you actually plug it into the formula, which you can totally do that, this exponent would simplify to be 2, because it would be two 6-hour time periods. So this should be 12.5 milligrams. 
Now, your actual amount of time is not always something that's divisible by the half-life, which is what I have for the last part. So 15 hours is not going to be an exact half-life. So that's fine. We'll just plug it into the calculator. It's 50 times 0.5. Now, the exponent, 15 over 6. Okay, now, depending on your calculator. So if you guys have an 83, you're going to have to, like, put parentheses. But you don't have to reduce that fraction. So I'm going to do 50 times 0.5. I'm going to use my little carrot key. All right, if you have a calculator like mine where you can see the exponent, just do 15 divided by 6. You don't even have to reduce it. Okay, if you have an 83, if you do this, you just have to, when you hit the little carrot button, just put parentheses around the 15 divided by 6, and you should get the same thing. Um, but if you can't see that in your exponent, you just need to put parentheses around that fraction and you should be okay. And if you're not getting that number, I will be happy to come look at your calculator and help you with it. But this should be uh, approximately, because I'm going to round this, and a lot of times these are not nice numbers, so don't think that you're doing something wrong. This is about 8.84 milligrams of that substance. Those first two I did kind of like exact half-life, so they were decent numbers, but a lot of times it's not. And I have one more example with the half-life, and this is really just to make a little point. So this says I-123 is used for thyroid scans, and it has a half-life of 13.2 hours. It says write a decay function for a 360 milligram sample, so the 360 is going to be our A. And then we're going to determine how much is left after three days. Okay, now, just in general, the function, it's going to look exactly the same as what we just did. It's just y equals your initial amount, 360. If you're working with a half-life, that b value is always a half. And it would be x over 13.2 as my exponent. Sorry, this is shaking all over the place today. Now, here's the thing. The x has to be in the same units as the half-life when you plug it in. So whatever, if your half-life is in hours, your x value has to be in hours. If your half-life is in minutes, your x value has to be in minutes. So this question says my half-life is 13.2 hours, but then it tells me I need to know how much is remaining after three days. So you might, not always, but you might have to do a conversion real quick. I need to convert three days into hours so if I just do real quick, since my half-life is in hours, three, there's 24 hours in a day, so three days would be 72 hours. But your X value and your half-life have to be in the same units for you guys to use that equation. So just make sure, don't plug in three for your exponent. We gotta plug in 72. So three days is equal to 72 hours. All right, so then I'm just grabbing my calculator. 360.5, little carrot button. Okay, now. Again, if you, got, if you don't see the exponent, just put parentheses around this, but I'm just going to do 72 divided by 13.2, and after three days, we'd have about 8.21 milligrams of that substance left, and if you're not getting that, just let me know. I will come look at your calculator. 